I left Bovington camp in my civilian clothes and mentally blew a raspberry to my defunct army service. I was leaving behind the idiotic passion for conforming to witless orders, and behind me lay the constant bullshine of boot and brass and NCOs whose brain energy was that of a retarded pet pony. Stuff it. No regrets, right? Well, there was a sweet girl in the picture-book hamlet of wool who had tarried with me in the hay wain. I knew I'd miss some of the lads. My capacity for strong drink had given me quite a standing amongst the sots of the naffy, though that was all. I spent the next three weeks after Dumob in a haze of alcohol and pitiful self-indulgence. But I had to get back to work, and to please my mother, who believed that having a trade was a passport to security, I reapplied to the Cooperative Society in Balloon Street, Manchester, and was accepted back as an electrician pro temp. I still had to finish my apprenticeship, and I was placed under the heading Improver. Wrong. I was still as useless as ever. I hated the job, and I blew up several installations with gusto. The end was, of course, inevitable. I was summoned before a gentleman who rejoiced in the name of Bert Whistle, a grey, thin man who carried the burden of inept tradesmen upon his shoulders, and I was similarly dismissed from the CWS. I wasn't too bothered. In those days there were always jobs of sorts, most of them dead-end occupations, but jobs for all that. My trouble was, I simply could not settle down. I even began to miss the life of the army. I was restless, and when I celebrated my 21st birthday, I wallowed in self-pity and depression during the festivities of my coming of age, which were held in a pub called the Old Loom. My life was one of pub-crawling and trying to worm the pants off any female who appeared half-willing for bed sports. My parents were more than irritated with me, and when I started to write poetry, I'm sure they were fully convinced that they had an imbecile on their hands. But write, I had to. I don't know why. I still have a positive alp of rejection slips from sundry magazines to prove it. Finally, the words of my old teacher, Bill Hetherington, you have the ability to be a fine writer, drove me to plunge willy-nilly into one of the most stupid acts of my life. I went to Paris. Paris. Was there ever such a city? With less than thirty pounds in my pocket, I wandered from the Sacré Coeur to the Bastille, and from Odeon to Madeleine. The city drew me into its moor of enchantment. Paris is a woman, a spoilt, saucy minx of a woman, who steals your heart away. Paris, city of smells, cheap perfume, exotic tobaccos, pissoirs, heady aromatic wines. Paris is pavement cafes and dark glasses, perno and bistros. She is history and avenues of trees. She is panting traffic and starving artists. She is the turgid sane and strolling lovers. She is magnificent, if you have the money. I rented a flat that was so small, when I turned on the light I was in bed before it was dark. The flat was situated in a winding street called Monsieur le Prince. I eagerly began to write my essays, which wasn't easy for a red-blooded young man. There were too many distractions. Noisy cafes, beautiful women who drifted by and played merry hell with my libido. And with two weeks I was a pauper, and my landlady, a voluble, heavy-set, bad-tempered virago, was demanding the rent. I didn't need to understand French to get the message that soon I would be pitchforked onto the streets. My diet consisted of a length of dry bread and wine so cheap it was probably fermented for a shilling a gallon. The landlady one night grabbed my collar and propelled me to the stairs. In abject terror, I pleaded with her for time to pay. Something happened. Maybe I struck a deep chord within her. Anyway, the upshot was she lent me 10,000 francs, about 10 pounds in English currency. France in the fifties was experiencing dire inflation, but the ten pounds was a lifeline and a breathing space. I was alone, and yet I did not feel alone in Paris. The magic of the metropolis gripped me. With my ill-shod feet and sprouting beard, I looked the part of what was referred to as an existentialist, the forerunner of the modern hippie. They were to be found everywhere, those existentialists, in jazz cellars, pavement cafes and smoky bistros. 
talking about life and the need to relinquish all the fetters of responsibility that manacled mankind. But it was still apparent that if I didn't get a job, I would finish up a mouldering bundle of rags in the charity ward. I had to earn money. One night I met two English lads who were on holiday, and they took me for a drink, which led to many more. I toured them around the left bank, and I felt Parisian. We finished up in a small, dimly lit club called Al Romance. The place seemed empty, vacant bar stools and a huge grand piano, but no people, save an Algerian barman. My new friends ordered the drinks, and I played the piano. The tune I played was the haunting theme from the Charles Chaplin film, Limelight. A blousy woman in a tight red dress came down some stairs, lit a small cigar, and listened to me play the instrument. When I'd finished, she patted me on the shoulder and spoke to me in rapid French. Then, as now, I didn't speak a word of the language. The woman was the owner of the nightclub, and her name was Eva. The upshot of that meeting was that she employed me to play the piano nightly, from midnight until 3am. One catch, and a strange one. She only wanted me to play Limelight. I was to find out why later. My two newly acquired friends had nowhere to stay for the night, so we crept up the rickety stairs to my flat and threw ourselves on the floor to sleep off the drink. A smell roused me from my dormant state, and again a new fact of life entered into my existence for the first time. My companions were smoking pot. Just what the concoction consisted of I'll never know, but it must have been quite remarkable, because one of them was crowing like a rooster with an inane grin on his face, and the other one, to my intense dismay, was attempting to climb through the window of my cramped quarters. As the room was a few stories up, not unnaturally, I was panic-stricken. I pulled the would-be aviator down from the ledge where he was now perched, and as we fell in a heap, I saw to my horror that the other one had removed his trousers and was showing his pink rump to my landlady, whose face was something out of Hogarth. She screamed and kicked his naked backside with her formidable sabot. This caused him to hurtle into the room, and he cannoned into my friend, who, in retaliation, bit me on the foot. It was a nightmarish scene, which ended its comic run when the landlady's soulmate, upon hearing the rumpus, chased us all out with a cavalry sabre. Needless to say, I spent the rest of that night sleeping on the banks of the Seine. I never saw my two would-be chums again, but the mere mention of drugs or usage of can immediately conjure up the scene that took place that night. Broke and nowhere to stay. I sat throwing stones into the turgid waters of the River Seine, with Notre Dame glaring down at me with a religious fervour and passers-by glancing tentatively at my forlorn figure. A rather well-to-do man approached me and spoke in voluble French. When he discovered I was English, he asked, haltingly, had I nowhere to go? Was I hungry? Oh, sorry, I thought. Que sera. He wants my bum, he can have it. I was famished. We set off and ate a delightful steak in a steamy bistro that was wedged on the Saint-Germain-des-Prés. Later, he ushered me into a nicely furnished flat and bade me stay until I wanted to leave of my own accord. And that was that. The bed looked inviting, and I undressed. The door opened, and a bold-looking girl came in and simply smiled and took her clothes off. Well, what does one do? It was all satisfactory until I heard a whirring sound coming from behind a closet door. We were being filmed. I was out of that room like a Polaris missile, leaping about as I dragged my pants on. I went back to plead with my ex-landlady, and mercy of mercies. She took me back. The piano-playing job helped me to pay back my snorting landlady, but it was an engagement of madness. Every night I would sit playing limelight over and over again, and there wouldn't be a soul in the place. Eva seemed satisfied with me, and she would stand with her hand on my shoulder, humming the tune, pouring drinks into me. I'd been there a week before the penny finally dropped. The club was a brothel. The clients entered the club by the rear door and bounded up the stairs to cubicles, where five girls plied their trade. I was merely a front for the place. One of the prostitutes, a coloured girl called somewhat exotically Emerald, took a liking to me and looked after me in more ways than one. She was highly intelligent, despite the way she lived, and we would talk away for hours, then stroll down to Les Halles and rub shoulders with every strata of society who went to Les Halles for one thing. The onion soup. Ah, 
that soup. In the smoke-wreathed, dimly lit cafes, we sat and slurped that most delicious concoction with its raft of strong cheese and spices. Later she would lead me to bed and use my body with her professional expertise. They couldn't last, and it didn't. Riots in the Algerian quarter led to increased police activity. Eva was arrested and the club closed down. I tiptoed out to my lodging, still owing 2,000 francs, and I went home by train and boat. I arrived at my parents' council house with tuppence in my pocket, but a wealth of memories. To keep the wolf away, I took a job selling insurance for the Liverpool Victoria, whose offices were situated in a poor area of Manchester. My first task was to post 2,000 francs to my landlady in Paris, and a thank-you note.